All right. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, we're going to go ahead and start uh, this meeting. Uh, so before I introduce our um, speaker today, Dr. Ginto, I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. A lot of you don't know me. Uh, my name is Giovanni, or Gio for short. Um, I'm an MS3 at UCLA, DGSOM, um, in the global health um, pathway. Um, and I will actually be going to the Philippines um, for my discovery year um, doing research for Dr. Ginto, um, which is why I'm introducing him today. Um, so without further ado, I, Dr. Renzo Ginto um, is an Associate Professor of Global and Planetary Health at the Singh Health Duke and U.S. Global Health Institute, um, the Duke and U.S. Medical School, and the National University of Singapore. Um, he works on diverse projects. Um, diverse aspects of the climate and health nexus, such as climate resilient and environmentally sustainable health systems, impacts of climate change on mental health, climate migration and health, climate Im Im implications on global health interventions, um, climate and health education, um, and basically like ethical issues around climate and health and, and among other things. Um, he holds many appointments um, such as at St. Luke's Medical Center um, in the Philippines and also the University of Cambridge. Um, and he's also a member of the National Panel of Technical Expert Experts um, the, of, of the Philippine Climate Change Commission, um, WHO's Technical Advisory Group um, on the Ethics of Climate Change and Health, um, editorial boards of several journals, including the Lancet of Planetary Health um, and, other, and other Lancet commissions, um, and among others. Um, ultimately, Dr. Ginto um, is a pioneer of planetary health um, and global health um, in general. Uh, more, more importantly, he's one of my mentors. Um, he willingly took me under his wings to um, help me kind of start this intersection of my research, which is um, in between planetary health and global surgery. I'm interested in going into orthopedic surgery, and I really wanted to go back to the Philippines and do research um, on this um, kind of intersection. Um, so I will be, that's what my discovery of research will be, kind of assessing and analyzing the surgical systems in climate vulnerable countries, specifically in the Philippines. Um, so Dr. Ginto will give you more of an, a, a back, give us more of a background on what planetary health is and what he's done in the past and what he's doing in the future. Um, and so that will just a brief introduction of Dr. Ginto. So Dr. Ginto, take it away. Thank you very much, Gio, for that very generous introduction. And of course, I'm very, very excited, looking forward to working with you uh, on, on bringing together surgery and, and planetary health, as, as you mentioned. So, um, and I hope to encourage all our uh, uh, students, uh, future doctors who are in this uh, virtual room uh, to consider um, uh, you know, bridging medicine with, with planetary health, with climate change. And I guess that's, that's going to be the main focus of my talk. Of course, thanks to UCLA, to uh, colleagues, Tracy, uh, Wells for, for making this happen. Uh, and again, I as I mentioned a while ago during our chit chat prior to the event, uh, I hope this is just the beginning of more collaborations uh, between me and UCLA, between the Philippines and UCLA. I know there are a lot of uh, Filipino Americans in the UCLA community, um, but also Southeast Asia in general. As you mentioned, I'm now based in Singapore where I'm establishing a future Asian center for planetary health. Uh, and so many things are happening and I'm really, really thankful for this opportunity. Thanks to for your flexibility because uh, we have to change the schedule due to my uh, uh, ever evolving <laughs> and changing schedule as well. Uh, but we made it happen. I really want to make this happen and it's happening now. Um, let me share my screen and let me know if you can now see it. Okay. So yes. thank you. Wonderful. And um, I already alluded to this a while ago, right? Uh, that that I hope in your medical practice, in your future medical practice, you're already uh, practicing medicine as, as young physicians in training, that you will expand the healing mission of your work and that you will bring more planetary health into your work. Maybe you're wondering how, you know, the question is how, how do we do that? And it's very important that we know what planetary health is first and foremost uh what are the issues that we are uh tackling when we talk about planetary health and then towards the end i will talk be talking about um the how right how are we going to do it in our clinical practice in the way we're educated as uh, future physicians uh at the level of the health system and as a global community um so 
I'm just wondering, uh, and maybe you can just, um, uh, you know, say in the chat box or, um, you know, raise your hand. Uh, how many of you have heard the phrase planetary health before, uh, before coming to this talk? Uh, who among you uh, is, is familiar uh, with this phrase? Of course, apart from Gio, uh, who is very... I suppose after listening to several of my planetary health talks when he visited in Manila, is already very planetary health educated, equipped, and empowered. Uh, I'm just curious, and and I know everybody is probably, um, you know, traveling and 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 uh, uh, multitasking while listening to this talk. But later on, I would love to hear your perspectives. And um, welcome to the era of planetary health. Um, and. I'm welcoming you to this era because we now live in this day and age when our health, the health of people, the health of human populations is very much shaped not only by, you know, our own behaviors, um, by our, our own habits, uh, not even by natural phenomena or processes. Um, there is now an increasing role uh, for global environmental change in driving and in influencing our health, you know, the health of humanity. Um, and as you can see in this diagram, there are many environmental problems happening around us, but these environmental problems are in fact our own doing, our own making, right? Um, you will see here our consumption patterns, the demographic shifts that we see, migration, urbanization, technological advancement, all of these are creating these wide array of uh, environmental or ecological damages, pollution to the air, water, and land, loss of biodiversity, climate change, which we will be discussing extensively in a short while. All of these eventually then, ultimately, and we'll just skip the rest of the diagram, lead to a wide range of health outcomes or health impacts. And so in short, all these environmental problems that we created ourselves are then impacting our own health in return, right? It's a cycle, whatever we sow, we reap. Whatever we do, you know, it, ha it, it goes back to us uh, in, in return. And that really is what the era of planetary health is about, you know? Uh, I always remind uh, my medical students in the Philippines, now in Singapore, and everywhere I lecture around the world, I always say, in this day and age, we now have two patients. On one hand, you have this kid wearing a face mask, trying to protect herself from the unseen coronavirus or from bad air quality. But on the other hand, you have Mother Earth also wearing a face mask, of course, not to be protected from the virus, but to be instead safeguarded from the myriad ecological damages that we have been inflicting on her as a result of our irresponsible human activities and decisions. So again, welcome to the planetary health era. We now have two patients, not just the people, but also the planet. And thanks to those who are already giving their initial um, insights uh, in, in the chat box later on, maybe we can process them uh, during the Q&A. So again, two patients, people and planet. We cannot anymore separate you know, the people from the planet. The health of people greatly depends on the health of the planet. And um, this is um, something that has been, um, I suppose, evolving or emerging for some time now, for the past several decades. Um, in the 1990s, there's this Australian epidemiologist physician, Anthony McMichael, one of the first to actually write about the linkages between climate change and, uh, and human health. And he said in this uh, 1990s commentary that the health sector must lift its gaze to bigger ecological horizons. This will require a radical extension of the public health agenda. So he's saying that we cannot anymore just be talking about health of people. It, we need to extend, we need to lift our gaze to bigger eco ecological horizons. Look at the climate, look at you know, the, 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 the configuration of our ecosystems, even our political and social systems. And then fast forward, you will see at the bottom, he is encouraging us to develop an ability to collaborate 
with unfamiliar disciplines such as climatology and ecology. So I always remind my medical students, my future uh, you know, doctors to be, that by the time you graduate from medical school, you should have at least five new friends who are not fellow physicians. Maybe one friend who is an ecologist, another an economist, maybe even a philosopher, because many of the planetary health challenges and questions that we've been trying to answer uh, are, are deeply moral and ethical in nature, right? And, and so this is really uh, an encouragement for all of you to, to go outside of your comfort zone, to be friends with different kinds of people from different backgrounds, different sectors, different disciplines. And that is part of this radical extension that McMichael was describing several decades ago. And again, you know, this, this idea that we need to also start caring for the planet as we care for people. It's not a novel invention. It's not a new idea. This idea that the health of people and the health of the planet are inextricably linked. These uh, have been uh, espoused and embraced by indigenous communities from across the world, from different parts of the world. Uh, as you can see here in this quote from Chief Seattle and an indigenous leader from the Americas, the earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. Isn't it the planetary health message that I was describing to you a while ago? Whatever we sow, we reap. Whatever we do to the planet, they all come back to us in the form of human disease, despair, disability, if not death. So again, it's not a new idea. We just need to listen to ancient wisdom, to the wisdom of indigenous peoples. And so now I'm, I'm shifting gears a bit. You know, I, I, I gave you an intro about planetary health. And when we talk about planetary health, we're interested in the health of both people and the planet. When we talk about the health of human populations, we have so many ways to measure, you know, our health, you know, from you know, biomarkers even to, um, you know, anthropometric measures. And then at the population level, we talk about life expectancy, maternal mortality ratio, among others. But then how do we measure the health of the planet, right? And, and later on, why should we be concerned about it? So I want to introduce to you this framework from the Stockholm Resilience Center in Sweden. It's called the Planetary Boundaries Framework. When we say something is a boundary, a boundary cannot be crossed over. We cannot you know, go beyond it. We cannot trespass it. We cannot cross it. Um, and because if we do so, something happens, right? You get caught. <laughs> and in the case of the planetary boundaries, um, you, get, you get caught in a situation when the planet is not any more conducive for living, for survival. And so these are, this is the framework. This is the diagram. As you can see, there are actually nine planetary boundaries that have already been identified by, again, the Stockholm Resilience Center. And the sad news and the bad news is that out of the nine boundaries that have already been identified, six are already breached or transgressed or crossed. Okay? And those are the ones in red in this, in this diagram. So what are those six boundaries that have already been violated? Climate change, which we will talk a bit more in a short while. Biosphere integrity or biodiversity loss. Over the past century, we've seen the fastest rate of creatures great and small in our diverse ecosystems. Last sy land system change. We've been turning our natural habitats, our natural lands into, you know, golf courses into you know factories into cities into human settlements okay we're human we've been humanizing nature that's what land system change is about fresh water fresh water change is um you know um is about our lakes and our rivers that are already not only over contaminate over consumed you know we've been using uh, you know, fresh water, you know, for, for human consumption. But also, our lakes and rivers are now over-contaminated with so many different things, right? Chemicals, our trash, etc. 
biogeochemical flows, the, fl the natural flows of phosphorus and nitrogen have already been disrupted because of our global addiction to artificial fertilizers in the pursuit of large-scale agriculture so that we can feed uh, the global population. And then the last and most recent uh, planetary boundary that has already been violated or that was deemed to, be, to have been violated is the boundary for novel entities. When we say it's a no, it's they're novel entities, they are new chemicals invented in the laboratory, manufactured in the factory, released to the environment. And one of the shining examples of this is plastic. Because now plastic is not only floating in our seas and in our oceans, microplastic is also flowing in our bloodstream already. In the recent three to four years, there have been several studies saying, you know, it's now detected in the blood. They, they are now seen clogging our, um, you know, our, our, um, our uh, blood vessels. Um, they're even seen now in, um, what do you call this? In, um, in the brain, right, of, of, of mice at least. And I will not be surprised if it's, it can now be seen also in the brains of, of humans. So six out of nine planetary boundaries. If we know that the planet's health is vital for human health, this should be a cause for alarm for us in the medical profession. We should be extremely worried about this and we should be acting on this. Um, as, as the root causes of, uh, you know, um, health uh, decline, not only today, but also for tomorrow, for the future. And this diagram or this set of uh, charts just show to you that over time, we've been crossing more and more boundaries, okay? From three boundaries only in 2009 to four boundaries in 2015, now we have six boundaries crossed. Hey, what will be the news in a few years, few years' time? And we don't even know if these boundary transgressions are reversible, right? So we we you know um, um we want to make sure the remaining boundaries don't get crossed, but we are also still struggling to find out if the other boundaries, the 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 crossing, the the transgressions can can still be reversed, right? Uh, to heal the planet, to restore the planet. So that is now the big question in, in science, in earth science, in planetary health. So I introduced to you the planetary boundaries. We need to protect and safeguard the planet's boundaries in order to secure the health of people and all life forms, not only human beings. But the question is, while we're doing that, we still need to also take care of people, their needs, their well-being, their rights, okay? Um, because we don't want to, again, just protect the planet and then forget the people that inhabit it, right? Um, and so there is a need to balance our ecological obligations and our social obligations, our obligations to, to society, to people, um, to meet the goals of humanity. And that's why this uh, British economist, Kate Rayworth, came up with this model called the donut economy, which brings together the planetary boundaries that I just enumerated to you a while ago, and the social foundation, which uh, many of them are part of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which I hope uh, you all know, right? Uh, food access, water, health, education, gender equality, uh, housing, and, and many others. So those are the social foundations that still need to be provided to people while at the same time, we're protecting the ecological ceiling, okay? So that is a, a, a very difficult and challenging balancing act that needs to be achieved, that needs to be done. And that's why she was saying our future economy, our future society will need to stay within that safe and just space for humanity between the outer circle, which is the ecological ceiling, the planetary boundary, and the inner circle, which is the social foundation. And that space, as you can see, looks like a donut. That's why it's called the donut economy. I highly encourage everybody 
who wants to be a planetary health champion and advocate to read this book because it will provide you the, uh, the foundational understanding on why the current economy cannot heal the planet while at the same time, it's not healing us, right? Because of, as you, as you see, uh, there's a lot of uh, inequity around us given the current economic system. And it's also the same system that destroys the planet. So the donut economy is the goal. And, you know, it's interesting. There was a study that was conducted by the University of Leeds. They asked the question of all the countries in the world, which one is closest to becoming a donut economy? And, you know, I forgot to replace Singapore with the United States, but you can imagine that the donut of the of Singapore is very similar to the United States. Uh, in fact, I think the donut of, of the United States has all the planetary boundaries outside in red, which means, you know, uh, a society has transgressed all the planetary boundaries or the limits given to that country, because, of course, we have... Uh, different geographical, you know, areas, right, and 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 uh, land land mass sizes and and population. So we were we're all given a budget, and if it there there are lots of reds outside in the circle or in this donut, it means you've already transgressed the planetary boundary budgets allocated uh, for you for your country. That's the case for Singapore, as you can see. Even if even if in terms of the social foundation, as you can see. They do not have a lot of rents inside, right? So it means, you know, they're doing well when it comes to providing the needs of their citizens. Meanwhile, in, you know, my home country, uh, the Philippines and, and Gio's, uh, um, you know, country of heritage, as you can see in, 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 the, in the donut of the Philippines, we're doing well when it comes to the environment. We've not transgressed so far any planetary boundary but you will see in the middle there's so many reds and 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 there's still poverty uh you know very high rates of poverty and and hunger and people a lot of people don't have adequate housing and energy access and food access and water access so we still have lots to do when it comes to the social foundation and the challenge is how to achieve that without transgressing the boundaries for the planet and in fact, the interesting thing about this study is that um, its conclusion was there's one country in Southeast Asia, which is a neighbor of Singapore and the Philippines, that is closest to becoming the donut. And that is the country of Vietnam. As you can see, only one planetary boundary transgressed uh, slightly, uh, which is the boundary for climate change, carbon emissions. And then in this, at the center, you will see not so many red uh, sections of, of the inner circle. It means they're doing well when it comes to achieving the social foundation. So, so maybe the question that we should be asking is how can we be like Vietnam and avoid the trajectory of high income countries that have improved the lives of their citizens, but still with inequalities like in the US, while at the same time really contributing to the acceleration of the planetary destruction the transgression of the boundaries. So if you're interested, there's a website, you can put your country uh, or any country in the world and it will uh, spit out you know, the donut for that country. It might be helpful for those who are doing their global health discovery uh, you know, uh, course, right? If you're going to a country, look for the donut of your country and see how you can um, you know, bring this discussion and discourse to that country. So. Now I'll, I'll shift gears and zoom into one of the planetary boundaries that we just discussed. And, and this is climate change. Climate change we know is the destabilization of the global climate system due to our uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, among others, resulting from our human activities, our energy systems, our systems of production, uh, transport systems, food systems, uh, et cetera. And then climate change is, lead, is, is um, driving a cascade of major changes in the, in the environment. There are subtle changes in the e ecosystems, uh, glacial loss, uh, rising of the sea level, uh, melting of the ice, um, you know, 
in a uh, slow but sure increase in the uh, ambient temperature, etc. And then you also have these extreme events, right? Like storms, you call them hurricanes in, in the States. We call them typhoons in the Western Pacific. Uh, droughts, flooding, heat waves. All of these will alter, modify the social and the environmental determinants of health, which you can see in the middle. And then ultimately they will affect all the arenas of health that we know of, right? Every aspect of health not only physical health, but also mental health. I have one slide, uh, a few slides on that in a while. And in fact, um, I want to encourage you to visit this very interactive website from the New England Journal of Medicine. What you can do is you click on the organ system and it will tell you how that organ system is going to be affected by climate change. So the message is that every specialty of medicine has a vital role to play to make sure we protect our patients, we prevent disease that climate change can, can bring, can, can exacerbate, right? So you click on cardiovascular, it will show to you how extreme heat, for example, will be affecting our circulatory system. Same thing with dermatology, same thing with child health in, uh, for, for pediatrics, uh, among others. And then another important message when it comes to climate and health is that climate and health is an issue ultimately of equity and justice. This is a map from a paper that I co-wrote and you will see the parts of the world that have emitted the greatest amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. In a way, we already alluded to this a while ago in the donut economy discussion, right? North America, your country also, um, you know, Europe, you know, Russia, as you can see, these are the countries that have already exceeded their planetary boundary fair share in terms of carbon emissions. But then who are the countries that will bear the brunt, that will suffer the consequences of climate change and its health effects? You will see here, um, Africa, Asia, okay? Latin America, whether it's due to diarrheal, di diarrheal disease, malaria, for heat, it's interesting, almost the whole world uh, is, is um, you know, at risk uh, and, and maybe heat related illness No one is uh, immune <laughs> to being exposed to heat, okay? Um, and then undernutrition as well. Um, by the way, I was told by my computer, my internet went unstable, but I hope I'm, I'm still with you and I'm not um, uh, a bit, um, you know, choppy. So now I just zoom into my, my region, Southeast Asia. Um, and if you have not been to Southeast Asia, I would like to invite Maybe you can visit Gio while he's doing his uh, work with us uh, next year uh, in the Philippines and, and maybe we'll travel to other parts of the region as well to, to really see how climate change affects health and, and surgery in particular. Uh, but here you will see in this map, the redder the country is, the higher the vulnerability of that country is to climate change. And unfortunately, um, our beloved Philippines is the most vulnerable of them all, the reddest of them all. And, you know, the country is um, frequently hit by cyclones coming from the Pacific, again, in the U.S. Now you're uh, experiencing more and more hurricanes each year, uh, which are growing in number and in, um, you know, magnitude as well. Um, and imagine in the Philippines, during the pandemic, we were trying to uh, fight two crises happening at the same time. On one hand, you have the climate disasters and on the other hand, you have COVID-19. And you are sending people away from their houses that were destroyed by the typhoon. They're sending them to evacuation centers that are crowded, that do not have uh, the necessary uh, living conditions that become a breeding ground, a petri dish for COVID-19 and other infectious disease outbreaks. And then extreme heat is um, again becoming uh, a very uh, uh, major uh, pressing threat now in, in Asia in general, but in the Philippines also in particular. Uh, from May to, sorry, from March to June this year, uh, Asia has been hit by a massive and uh, prolonged heat wave season, 
unprecedented in our history. And many of our health systems in this region are largely unprepared for heat. We're prepared for flooding. We're prepared for dengue and other diseases, but we're not prepared for heat. Unlike, for example, um, in the U.S., you already have some of the heat preparedness systems. Of course, uh, I know you will say that you know they're, they're still imperfect, right? And there's always room for improvement. Uh, but those are the systems that are close to absent uh, in Asia still. Um, and we need to make sure we're prepared for future heat wave seasons as climate change progresses. I already alluded to infectious diseases being impacted or influenced by climate as well. We know that climate change, and I will not belabor you with the details of this diagram, will influence the epidemiological triad. It will affect the pathogen itself, how it behaves, it, uh, including the vector, like the mosquito or the rodent, in the case of, uh, you know, for example, leptospirosis. It will alter the environmental conditions. It will alter even the host response to infectious disease. But that's an area of uh, uh, interesting, you know, research, you know, how our immune system is going to change in, in hotter temperatures. Uh, and but, but ultimately, what will happen is that the more familiar infectious diseases will continue to rise or will even resurge, you know, the dengue and the malarias. And then on the other hand, you have new infectious diseases, many of them unknown. Remember, WHO calls them disease X. And there is a high chance that more disease Xs will emerge as climate change ensues. So here is an example of a familiar infectious disease that is now expanding in geographical scope. Dengue, for example, you can't find that before in Europe and in many parts of the United States. Now they're all, you know, the mosquito is bringing the dengue uh, virus to many different places. And then I already mentioned, alluded to this a while ago, uh, climate change in itself could spark the next pandemic. Okay. And unfortunately, the part of the world where the next COVID might happen due to climate change is, is my part of the world, Southeast Asia, as you can see, it's the pinkest, but also some parts of Africa, some parts of Latin America. It's the global South. It's, it's the developing countries, home to some of the richest, most biodiverse ecosystems where these pathogens you know, live and thrive in wildlife where you know another pandemic might emerge because climate change is going to alter the configuration of our ecosystems the behavior of our wildlife etc we talk about infections we also need to talk about food and we have a food system that is not only unfair in the way it distributes nutrition across the population some people get more nutrition, even, sometimes even in excess num uh, amounts. And that's why we have overweight or obesity. But I just want to give a caveat. O overweight and obesity are multifactorial issues. They're not just about food, but food is a major driver, right? Physical activity is another uh, factor. But then on the other hand, you have people who are not receiving adequate nutrition. There's undernutrition, there's stunting, there are micronutrient deficiencies across the world, especially in the developing countries. But we also have the same food system that is contributing to the climate crisis because of carbon pollution. It's you, you know, our food systems use a lot of land, water, and 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 uh, energy. Um, and we also have these same food systems that are highly vulnerable to climate shocks and stresses. You know, when a hurricane happens, the whole farmland can get destroyed, and that can lead to less uh, productivity in, in agricultural productivity more food insecurity, and ultimately undernutrition in society. So this food system needs to be transformed okay? to make sure they're not contributing to the climate crisis. They're also, not resi uh, they're also resistant to shocks and stresses, and they are accessed by all in a fair and, and uh, you know, equitable way. And that's why there's a suggestion to move our global diet into what we call the planetary health diet. I will not go into the details. You can see the plate here. You can Google about it. But as you can just eyeball the plate, half of the plate 
is filled with greens and vegetables, on, uh, uh, less than one fourth dedicated to um, unrefined grains or whole grains, and then a very slim portion dedicated to red meat. And, and I know that um, you know many of our societies are still very meat loving. So this is going to be a major challenge. How do we transition our eating, uh, our consumption patterns to a more planetary health oriented diet? And then lastly, um, um, for this section, climate change affects the health of our brains and our hearts. Climate change is a mental and emotional health issue. When there's a hurricane, a typhoon, forcibly displacing communities, the victims can you know, acquire uh, post-traumatic stress that can last for weeks, if not a lifetime. And then people now, young people especially, are beginning to experience what we call climate or eco-anxiety, um, which is this feeling of fear and, and hopelessness and worry about you know, climate change. You know? and, and in fact, there's a 10 country study that was conducted, that was published in 2021. And it showed that among the 10 countries studied, it's the young people from the Philippines that are deemed the most climate anxious in the world. Okay? You can see some US numbers there. Uh, and and um, you know, I think for US, around 80% are saying they're, they're climate anxious, but it's at 90 you know, for a place like the Philippines. So, um, you know, this is going to be a, a continuous problem and we need to make sure we have the mental health services that can address these mental health impacts of climate change. And we need to also change our educational system, how to improve and or enhance climate literacy so people do not feel fear and anxiety, but instead they are uh, given the tools to act and to cope and to survive. So, you know, we now live in this climate planetary health era. Uh, the UN chief or climate chief says, we have only two years remaining to save the planet. You know, scientists says, uh, so say we have 1.5, uh, we have until 2027 uh, to keep the global average temperature increase below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So the question now that we need to answer is, you know, how can we be not part of the climate problem. Unfortunately, the medical community continues to operate as if the global climate system is doing okay. We're still on business as usual. Okay? In fact, we're uh, contributing to, to all sorts of pollution, including plastic during the pandemic, for example. Are we ready to build health systems that consider the climate? Okay? Are we ready to produce the next generation of health professionals who care for both people and the planet? So I'll try to be rapid here so we have some time for discussion and questions. Uh, here I'm just introducing to you a concept called climate smart healthcare. When we say climate smart healthcare, it brings together our sustainability responsibility. We need to make sure we have green healthcare, low carbon healthcare. We're doing no harm to the planet in the same way we made an oath to do no harm to our patients. And then we are also resilient. We are adaptive. We, we bend without breaking like the bamboo. We are the last sector standing when disasters strike. Okay? We continue the functioning of the health system, even in the face of a warming planet. Okay? So sustainability and resilience, those are the two components of climate smart healthcare. In this slide, um, and I'm going to rush this, um, you will see that there's so many sources of carbon or greenhouse gases in the healthcare system, from the energy that we use to the medicines that we purchase to the food that we serve to our patients and staff. So every aspect of the hospital can change and can be decarbonized. And then there are frameworks already that are existing. Uh, this one is from the Global Green and Healthy Hospitals. 10 pillars, 10 things that we can easily do to make our hospitals more climate friendly. And even in the different clinical specialties, I mentioned a while ago, every specialty has a role to play in addressing climate change. And, and, and there are specialties that are more carbon intensive. Surgery and anesthesiology are some examples. 
Uh, and that's why, you know, Gio and I are interested to look into surgical systems in low and middle income country settings. Are they carbon intensive? Are they contributing to, to climate? But also, are they climate ready? You know, can we continue the operations even in the middle of a hurricane, right? Or even in the time of uh, uh, a heat wave, right? So, so these are some questions that you may want to ask. I know everybody has uh, some clinical specialty in mind to pursue. How can we integrate climate smart healthcare into our respective uh, clinical specialties? Okay? Um, and then climate resilient health systems, remember the other part is resilience, how to make sure the health system does not collapse, but instead recovers and recovers better than before and even transforms again in the face of climate related shocks and stresses. And, and here you will see a listing of what the things that we need to do. We need to invest in the health workforce. We need to have robust disease surveillance systems that are connected to you know, the meteorological service, you know, the weather bureau. We need to engage communities and, and really work hard in disease prevention and health promotion, which are things that are also familiar to us in the health profession. So we need to, again, invest in uh, the different building blocks of the health system and incorporate climate resilience into all of these uh, arenas of healthcare. We need to be more familiar with the use of climate data, okay, and how to use it to inform our decision making and planning in the health sector. So, for example, this is just a map of my hometown in the Philippines. And what I did is, if if climate change worsens, what will happen to the hospitals and the health facilities in my hometown? And lo and behold, many of them will be underwater if climate change will continue and if more flooding will occur. We need more planetary health education. And that's why I'm great that, to, uh, I'm thrilled that UCLA is doing this, uh, that we have this planetary health lecture, a special one for our future doctors. Hopefully this will be embedded in the curriculum. This will be expanded in scope and that there will be more opportunities for medical students and all health professionals to learn about these things, not only in the classroom, not only in Zoom, but through experiential learning, right? How can we use the hospital and the clinic and the community as a learning place for planetary health? And we need to work with other sectors and disciplines, which I already highlighted earlier on. Because every sector contributes to climate. Every sector is also uh, susceptible uh, or vulnerable to climate. And every sector is connected to the health sector. So we have no choice but to work with the transport sector, the urban planners, the food sector, we already highlighted the importance of food, et cetera, in order to improve the health, not only of people, but also of the planet. So in the Philippines, we have this community called Planetary Health Philippines, visit our website, planetaryhealth.ph, where we bring together people from all sorts of disciplines and sectors and geographies and even generations to you know, work together towards advancing the health of people and planet. I'm reaching the end of my talk. I'll just show to you very quickly these final messages. One, there's no planetary health without climate justice. We have to make sure the vulnerable is given extra attention. We need to fight inequities, inequalities, disparities. We need to tackle the structures, the systems that create both health inequity and the climate emergency in the first place. You know, we physicians are not only in the business of alleviation of symptoms, we are in the business of finding the etiology of the problem, of the disease, and, and finding a cure and finding an ultimate solution. We are now encouraged to embrace this new Hippocratic Oath. I invite you to look at this Lancet commentary that I co-wrote, uh, where we envision, if we're going to rewrite the Hippocratic Oath, the physician's pledge, and write it in the era of planetary health, what will it look like? And we, we wrote there that we need to now embrace this additional responsibility for the care of the planet, okay? And that is my encouragement to all of you. I think planetary health is an invitation
to planetary humility. It invites us to shift away from this ego logical perspective. Oh, we human beings are at the top of the pyramid of nature. We can mine, extract, kill, contaminate, pollute, destroy, consume, produce, etc. And instead, we need to shift towards a truly ecological perspective where we human beings live in harmony with all creatures, great and small, with nature, and with all the other components of planet Earth, our one and only home. And finally, I think planetary health is a call for us to become good ancestors, another fantastic book. What we want is that in 2124, 100 years from now, the children of 2124 will read the history books, we look back to the past, and they will say that the COVID and climate generation of 2024, which is all of us in this Zoom, we're good ancestors to them because we made the right decisions, not only for our own health, but also for their health and well being as well. Are we ready? Are the students, are the future doctors of UCLA ready to become good ancestors and not to be selfish ancestors to these children and to the future children of America, the Philippines, and the world entire who are yet to come? So together, let's advance the health of both people and the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ginto, for that talk. Um, I find myself hearing, I mean, I've heard you talk about this many times, but every time I hear you, I still am in awe of kind of this concept of planetary health that I myself didn't hear um, before talking to you. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the medical students here um, present also have not heard about as well. Um, Anyways, um, now we're going to open to questions from the group. Um, does anyone have any questions to Dr. Ginto um, about planetary health or anything else that he has talked about? And thanks to you, Gio, again. Um, and thanks to those who are engaging in our, in our chat box. We're seeing some activity uh, there. Looking forward to more questions and comments and insights. If if um no one has a question, or if, if I'm, I'm going to give some people some time to think about a question, I do have a question that could be relevant to everyone here. You know, as um, budding physicians, as physician, uh, student physicians, student doctors, how do you think um we 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 can do a lot of things? I guess like doing discovery research on this thing, but as as students right now, are there any particular things you think you can encourage us to do to kind of be better advocates of planetary health? Um, for our patients in the hospital, um, in clinic, or wherever it may be. Yep. Thanks, Gio. Um, well, in the presentation, I think uh, from the beginning to end, you've heard so many potential, um, you know, uh, things that that you can do, right? Whether it's in the education side, you educate yourselves, you educate others, um, uh, and including your patients. And that's one interesting challenge, right? How do you in a way, make this more understandable to the patients in the communities that we serve, right? And and you can imagine, Gio, that you know I have a a version of this for the patients, and I have a version of this presentation for the president of the Philippines, right? So we, we need to know how to uh, present planetary health to different audiences. Um, so so communication is vital, and 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 that needs to be um, uh, to be improved and and diversified. Uh, and it calls for more creativity, energy, and imagination. You know, our young people here, our future doctors, you're tech savvy and you're very creative and social media uh, connected. That's an opportunity uh, for you to, to, again, think of better ways to communicate these uh, uh, messages that are one, uh, can be technical and, and challenging to understand. But number two, you know, I'm, I'm presenting to you somehow a a gloom and doom future. Uh, but I hope you didn't feel only gloom and doom when I was talking about it, right? And, and that you feel also empowered. And yes, we only have two years remaining according to the UN head, uh, but we also have two years to work, right? That, so that's also flipping the story, but also feeling the sense of urgency. We need to act now. So education, communication, we have an important role to play. Um, 
And then, you know, in a way, I already encourage you because I may, maybe some of you are already thinking of oh, what am I going to do with, uh, in my future clinical practice? I'm, I will be a surgeon. I will be uh, an OBGYN. I will do uh, emergency medicine. Start thinking how to incorporate this into your practice, right? Um, and, and because this is a new area, you already alluded to the need for more research. Uh, you know, we have like millions of research questions to ask, <laughs> ranging from how climate impacts, you know, I, I mentioned the epidemiological trial. We know little how it will alter our human bodies. We know some idea when it comes to the pathogen. We know, we know some aspects also of how it will change the environment. We know little about how those interactions will out, be altered as well. And then ultimately how uh, the medical response from prevention all the way to cure will also need to be in a way uh, you know, adjusted and, and improved and enhanced again in the context of, of climate change. Um, and ultimately I think what is you know, what we can do all, uh, eventually, uh, what we can do instantly, right, now is mindset change, right? From now on, when I leave this Zoom call, I am perhaps a better doctor <laughs> because I am not anymore just uh, thinking about the organ system I'm, that I'm interested in. I'm now looking at it through a broader, you know, from a broader lens, through a broader lens, with a bigger context, with a greater appreciation of how we're all interconnected, uh, with a better understanding of how complex the times we live in uh, at the moment. So, so I think that that's something we can all do now, right? Uh, and and when the mindset, there's a mind, uh, a change in mindset, there will be, hopefully, we will be able to change the sets of minds that we interact with in our workplaces, in our hospitals, in our communities. Thank you. And yeah, does anyone else have any questions? Feel free to type it out or unmute yourself. I had a question. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Aguinto, for your talk. It was really interesting and definitely something I've never heard about before. Um, my question is your insights on like the food industry. Um, particularly in those countries like the U.S. that are very in the red zone with the donut that you showed us. Um, it seems like we have this narrative that you have to like mass produce and use a lot of like pesticides um, to have enough nutritious food available for people. Um, but there are countries like Mexico who have very healthy green donuts and don't seem to do that as much. Could you talk a little bit about where you see like a healthy balance in the food industry being so that we can both provide nutritious food for people, but also not damage the planet so much? Yep. Thank you very much, Doris, for that uh, important question. And, and thanks also for um, telling us that there are some countries that are doing okay, right? When it comes to the donut and the food system, uh, it's interesting, I just recently watched a, a documentary about how um, Mexico is trying to preserve, right, their, um, their traditional uh, maize, uh, corn um, varieties, right, and, and making sure that's not, um, in a way, contaminated by, you know, foreign varieties and more so varieties that are so, that are pushed, pushed by commercial actors, right? Uh, uh, which which you have a lot on the other side of the border in in the U.S. Right. So so um, I think um, you know we health professionals don't don't speak a lot, speak too much, and speak too loudly about the food system, right? Because I think we've relegated that to people working in the agricultural sector. But now I think is the time, given our understanding of the donut, you know, how the food system is both creating the health problems and creating the environmental problems. I think we need to speak more and we need to, to really use the power of our evidence to influence, you know, the power that makes the decisions and that controls the food sector, the food industry, the commercial determinants of food uh, uh, that, that, uh, that, that surround us, unfortunately. Uh, and then you, know, you may be wondering, okay, we, let, let's advocate. That's one. Let's let's do more research. Let's use the power of our evidence. Those are things that we can do. Let's educate our patients. 
um, let's work with local farmers and encourage them to, to do better and to promote their produce uh, to our patients, to our communities. Um, let's start within our own backyard. Our hospitals and medical schools should be providing, selling healthy, nutritious, and green and sustainably produced food to our medical students, to our staff, to our health professionals, right? Uh, if we can't do that in our own backyard, why why can why do we expect that change to happen in the broader uh, society in our communities? Um, and then last, and then there's also a room for us to influence our uh, you know nutritional guidelines. Um, you know, I think there are some countries in the world. Um, you know, I, I remember Qatar, I think Canada as well. They started including sustainability principles into the countries. Nutrition guidelines. I don't know if that's happening in the U.S. already, uh, but I know you have the healthy eating plate, right? I don't know if that is informed already or already changing uh, or already being revised, incorporating sustainability considerations as well. So I just gave you a listing of the many things that we can do as health professionals. I think the ultimate message is that we need to engage more in the food discussion. Uh, beyond the beyond our traditional clinical approach to to nutrition, right? We always j just focus on giving the information to the patients, but we are not influencing the tra the food system from which the food that our patients consume are coming from in the first place. Thank you so much, and uh, to respect the time of our um of the people here uh, we'll take one more question if anyone has one if not um you guys all have dr ginto's email the jedi can send it to you um please reach out to him email him if you have any questions or about this feature um this 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 field or you can also reach out to me um or if you want to talk in person